<clears throat> All right, we ready? Are we going? Okay, I think we're up now, uh, I suppose. Hello again, folks. Um, uh, welcome back to this, whatever the heck you want to call this, uh, Fad Talks. Um, we're going to be talking today about different drivetrains in FRC applications. Although a lot of this could be encompassed to any sort of robotics application um, where you want to get from point A to point B uh, with a vehicle. Um, so let's talk about, so in drivetrains, um, your major objective is to get from point A to point B. Um, and there's a lot of different ways to do that. Generally, a lot of things like to use wheels because wheels are a very easy way to convey yourself from one point to another. Uh, you're continuously just laying down a new area where you're going to go to. Um, but even within that, there's a lot of different ways you can lay those out. Um, a lot of ways you can be creative and accomplish different behaviors. So what are you looking for? You're wanting to go from point A to point B uh, as fast as possible without breaking down, without getting interrupted by other things like terrain or other robots that might be pushing around. You want to get over something. And with most things, we all want to be light, small, easy to design, easy to service, easy to work on, um, and easy to integrate into the rest of the system. You want to make sure you're leaving weight, space, and time to design other mechanisms or scoring systems uh, that actually get you what you want to do. A last consideration is drivability. Uh, generally, we're talking about something that is controlled by a human at some shape or form. So you need to have something that you can actually map human inputs to the operation of the device. And so that means maybe you have some microprocessors that you have to write additional code for. Maybe it means uh, you need to create some mappings. Maybe it means that more degrees of freedom can actually be more complicated to think about for the user. Um, you have to be considerate of exactly how this is gonna get controlled. The simplest drivetrain is a tank drive, um, which is basically just any number of wheels on either side that are powered together. Um, you can use any wheels in this type of setup, but generally we're looking at just plain traction wheels. Uh, nothing fancy, just tread on a wheel. They might also have a dropped center to help turning. So you have a bunch of wheels on one side. When the vehicle rotates, uh, there's going to be turning scrub as the frontmost and rearmost wheels actually slide. Uh, so, but if you can kind of arc the wheel pattern, um, that can increase the contact pressure on the center set of wheels, decrease it on the outside, which will decrease that turning scrub. We'll talk more later about uh, the vehicle dynamics behind this. But that's one thing you'll often see with these various different setups is They'll use different wheels and different parts in order to reduce this turning scrub while still maintaining a high degree of um, tractive force. If you want to go sideways, a very easy way to do this is to start using Omni wheels and Mechanum wheels. These are wheels that have rollers on them in addition to uh, the actual uh, main direction of rotation. Uh, so in the Kiwi drivetrain in the top left there, it has Omni wheels that uh, have rollers that are perpendicular to the primary axis of rotation. These rollers are unpowered, so by changing the force that is sent to each three wheels there, three different force vectors can be um, created, which causes the drivetrain to move in any direction simultaneously or instantly. By 
altering and varying the exact forces and speeds on each tire, you can produce any motion that you want. The downside, of course, is the traction is significantly reduced by those Omni wheels. You're limited to what types of compounds you can use, and there's generally just not going to be as grippy as a rough top tread or something that can really dig into the carpet. There are other configurations that leverage the same principle, such as a kilo drive, a mechanum drive, and a slide drive. I'm going to turn off my camera so that the presentation works a little bit better. This kilo drive over here has four wheels in kind of an X pattern. Uh, that gives you just a little bit more um, motive force in certain directions, which can increase the controllability. But now you have to worry about the frame being perfectly level with the ground because now it has four contact points instead of three. You think of a three-legged chair, you set it down, it's always flat and level. Think of a four-legged chair, it has to be just right on the ground. The same problem occurs with the mechanum wheel, which uses rollers at a 45 degree angle. It works on the same idea as the Kilo or the 4 Omni, except it's just a different wheel, which lends itself into integration towards a more traditional rectangular frame. You can see how that frame is very simple as opposed to the more convoluted and uh, Kilo frame that takes up a lot more space. The slide drive in the bottom right is kind of a compromise between both um, putting maximum power in one particular direction as well as adding the omnidirectional capabilities while keeping a very simple frame. So there's four omni wheels in kind of a traditional tank drive setup along with the center omni wheel that allows the thing to move side to side. Um, this again is going to need a suspension system in order to make sure that that center wheel achieves a good contact patch. Um, there's a couple different ideas of how to do this. Um, some of them are use a rocker pod. Uh, some of them actually push down directly with a suspension system. Some people have said, okay, I, I really like the pushing power of a traditional tank drive, but I still do want to move sideways. Why not do both? Um, why not put both these drivetrains together? And that's where transforming drivetrains start to come into place. Um, also called jump drives. Basically you have a tractive wheel um, that is usually powered also by the same motors that are powering an omni wheel, but it can be toggled on and off the I think we're back. We good? Okay, cool. Back to normal operating procedure. So Jump drives, again, are kind of like a tank drive and omni drive combination. Uh, you toggle on and off powered traction wheels with powered omni wheels. Um, so you're always having, or you're always making a choice between being able to go move sideways effectively and having a lot of pushing power. Um, generally, this is a reasonable trade off because if you're trying to go sideways, uh, you're probably making some sort of evasive maneuver or you're trying to get in position. You're not really trying to get in a pushing match. Um, in practice, you still have to make the user actually make a decision between do I need to be in traction mode? Do I need to be in omnidirectional mode? Um, it's one more decision that the driver has to make in any particular point in time. It's also a lot of mechanical complexity. Um, you're adding basically two drivetrains worth of weight in here. 
you may even start considering something uh, like swerve drive, where you are steering each wheel independently as well as potentially powering it independently. So you're always, so you're able to achieve that same omnidirectional motion, but you have always in contact with the ground a traction wheel. Now, this has a lot of caveats. It's quite a mechanically complex system and it requires programmatic, um, it, it requires your program to be correct as well. Because if your wheels are off, it's not just like, okay, send and redivert power to this other side and it's really easy for the driver to compensate. You really need the program to be working correctly. You need all of your encoder feedbacks to be correct. You need your control loops to be correct. Otherwise, this drivetrain is basically undrivable by a human operator. As well as the Omni wheels, you can basically flip the direction of a wheel very, very quickly. A swerve drive, you have to reorient the wheel. So there can be a little bit of latency in the actual driver inputs. There can be time between when the driver says, I want to switch from going straight to going left and that actually being actualized, whereas an Omni wheel Omni drive may have a little bit lower latency. As we ha as motor limitations have been lifted in FRC, uh, this limitation has started to go away, especially as people have started dialing in the drives, reducing a lot of the rotational weight, and adding more power to the steering axes. This concern has started to get lifted. Um, you'll notice very very agile swerves on the drive um, the field since pioneers like 16 Wildstang. Uh, Apple Pie, Mars Wars really started the swerve drive revolutions to other teams um, such as Jack and the Bot that you're seeing today just run with it like mad. There's two main different types of drives, although one is sort of one out today. There's coaxial and distributed drives. Coaxial drives, like the one in the top left, have the motors outside of the module. Um, their motors are rigidly fixed to a frame and all of the power is sent via gears and potentially a bevel gear to the wheel on the bottom. A distributed drive, like the one in the lower left, has the motor actually rotating with the wheel. Uh, this reduces the number of gears required, but it does make the motor much larger, or the module much larger, and weighs a lot more so that there is more force required to do the steering. So you're trading efficiency for agility in a strange sense. There's also a lot of different esoteric drivetrains you can make. You can make whatever you really want to get from point A to point B. The ones we've talked about so far are the most common, but over the years, you'll see a lot of strange drivetrains like ball drives on the top left. I think Technocats had a really interesting one in the early 2000s. Uh, Mars Wars had their Twerve drive, um, which is effectively a tank, tank drive on a swerve drive module that allows them to have that little bit of extra agility. Winnovation in 2011 made a lobster drive, which is effectively two tank drives, but they're oriented at 90 degrees to each other and they can be engaged and disengaged from the floor by a series of pneumatic pistons. That gave them some compromise between omnidirectionality where they could move sideways and always still having maximum pushing force. In 2002, uh, Team Hammond was infamous for their machine, which flopped down onto a set of walking file cards. These file cards engaged with the floor for an insane amount of tractive force. And in years afterwards, this was ruled illegal because it was just too damaging to the carpet and in a way, very, very grain baking. Um, actually turn off my camera again. Triple Strange in 2016 decided um, in order to get over a series of defenses and obstacles that year, they would need a tank drive, but they still wanted to use a swerve drive for pushing power and agility. So they actually put both drivetrains on their robot, which was very heavy, but it did work. <laughs> Even though it requires, well, about 10 motors, which is about half of the motors that you're allowed to use on a robot. All of those dedicated towards just moving. And 
and that brings us a little bit to talking about tank treads, um, which when we talk about tank treads in an FRC environment, we are referring to tank treads. If we talk about a tank drive, we may be referring to that multi-wheel drive, uh, just one side powered and the other side independently powered. Tank treads offer better climbing abilities in some ways than a multi-wheel drivetrain, but they do increase the complexity and they do introduce a lot of inefficiencies because that track has to flex, which takes a certain amount of energy. Um, you'll notice a tank tread robot does not coast as, as long as a tank drive robot will. There isn't really a lot of traction gain either. Um, you can actually do experimental testing and find that because the robot just doesn't sink into the carpet as much because of the really wide contact patch, there isn't a huge gain in traction. Um, there are certain gains by adding a larger uh, amount of tread, but at a certain point they just start to diminish and the tank tread robot might not give you that much. The rigid wheels in a tank tread robot can actually produce a lot of shock uh, if you aren't adding a suspension system. In many cases, the shock is almost more of a concern, and so a lot of teams will run a pneumatic wheel instead of a tank tread. That way the pneumatic wheel absorbs a little bit of the shock without the need to add a dedicated suspension system. There's other ways to get over obstacles as well. Um, in some cases, you can just lift up your front tires. Um, if you get big front tires, that makes it easier to go over obstacles. In the top right, you see a mechanism that the Cheesy Poofs used in 2012. This little tire here is on a pivot point here, which that can swing up. This pushes their front tires off the ground by a couple inches. That way they could get over a four inch bump in the center of the field without needing to make a very large drivetrain uh, that maybe even would have pneumatic tires, which could add a lot of squish to the robot that they did not want in a year where the robot was shooting something. So they needed a lot of stability on the ground. This system, uh, I've seen it a couple times um, to get over obstacles can work. There's other systems. Again, here is an example of some 10 inch pneumatic tires and you can use to get over some large obstacles. In this case, you can add an additional pneumatic suspension So you can get over large humps with the right tire. Not very complicated. A lot of times, this experimental testing is really all good. You should also test your drivetrain um, belly pan in all orientations. So, if you're going over a contoured ramp surface that might have a corner, that corner can actually be the thing that kills your drivetrain. You may be able to get over um, one side, you may be able to get the other side, but if you're going over the corner, you may still find that your belly pan, the bottom of your robot, actually catches and snags on that little corner there. You should always test in all orientations, whether you're doing that in CAD or you're doing that with a quick physical prototype. There's other ways to add additional maneuverability. Uh, Pop-up wheels and are one interesting way to do this. In this case, uh, the Robonauts in 2014 had a Omni wheel that pops up on the front of their drivetrain, which changes the steer, the center of rotation for the robot, allowing them to do some interesting maneuvers, especially as they kind of swing around from a high-speed maneuver. As you can see here.
Octagonal frames and polygonal frames can also be used to add a little bit of extra maneuverability. Um, so when your robot actually gets pinned against a wall, you may find it really hard to rotate and get out if you have a square frame. Uh, but if your frame is more circular, there's less of a pinch point. Uh, your robot can kind of just roll out of that pin maneuver and drive away. So some teams, especially around 2014, these got really popular where you'd cut the corners effectively. Well, so you still have a manufacturable drivetrain, but it allows you a little bit of leeway around defense. We should talk a little bit about basic dynamics as well when you're designing a drivetrain. Um, when you're designing a tank drive, oftentimes you'll want to add a drop center so that you reduce the uh, contact patch of the robot. Effectively, a drop center, as shown on the bottom right there, can uh, disengage the front set or the back set of wheels. What this does is if you consider how the wheels would turn while the robot turns, um, they, they slide left to right less when the ver front to rear distance from the center of rotation to the wheel is diminished. Um, so you can see that in the top right, how changing from a long configuration robot to a wide configuration robot decreases the turning scrub. You should also note that um, if you can bring all of the mass of your robot in towards the center, this can also increase the agility of the robot as it doesn't need to accelerate all of the mass that is far out. It needs to accelerate a small moment of inertia near the center of the robot. If you can also bring the turning center or yeah, the kinematic turning center where the wheels would dictate the robot turns about closer to the center of gravity, where um, in space, free space, the robot would orbit about, the closer those are, the lower the um, resistance to rotation will be. So you may sometimes build a two plus two drivetrain, which has two traction wheels in the rear and two omni wheels in the front. This makes it so that the kinematic um, pivot point would actually be in the rear, be um, in line with the two traction wheels since the omni wheels have no resistance to rotation. But the distance from the center of rotation to center of gravity has increased, so the maneuverability can go down in such a drivetrain. So let's talk a little bit about when you might want to pick what. Because we all of these drivetrains have up and downs. Um, there's no one size fits all. Uh, well, You'll see that some of these do have a lot of greens to them, but they have like one major killer, and that might be just the sheer amount of engineering effort to build it. So I've kind of divided up into four different sets of drives. Um, we have tank drives, omni drives, uh, transformer drives, and swerves. Tank drives are generally very good um, when you need something dead nut simple, very light, uh, very easy to integrate into the rest of a system and without sacrificing too much traction. The downside of them, of course, is they don't have many special or agile abilities. Um, it, takes a sig um, it takes a good driver in order to get them to go where they really need to go. As with all drivetrains, they do require some amount of practice, but um, you kind of pick up the controls and you can understand how a tank drive is going to work. With Omni drives, they require a little bit more mechanical and programmatic effort. They can generally be significantly heavier. Um, they can require take up a lot more footprint in your robot, especially a slide drive because it knocks out the whole center of the robot. But they integrate reasonably well into the rest of the system and they don't have much traction. Of course, they can go in any direction you want, but it does take some practice to actually get good at using that sideways shifting ability. A lot of drivers, when they're first picking up the sticks on a system like that, 
they don't really know what they're doing. They do not consider the loss of traction that they have. They don't really know how to make use of the sideways shifting abilities. Uh, it takes a good driver to actually leverage an Omni Drive, even though one may think you're having an additional degree of freedom. Again, it's one more thing that the driver has to think about. Should I turn and go towards my destination or should I strafe there? It's extra things they have to think about, which can actually require more practice. The jump drives um, require more mechanical and program complexity, a lot more weight, a lot more size, a lot more integration, but they get you increased traction when you need it and they get you omnidirectionality when you need it. They require even more practice than an omni drive because not only are you having to be able to use the omnidirectionality when you need it, you have to decide when you need it. So you have to pick your battles. When do I want to actually go sideways and when do I need to push another guy straight out of the way? It requires a lot more practice to use a jump drive. Swerve drive is the most costly of all in all categories. It requires a lot more programmatic design, a lot more mechanical design, although these fronts are getting better um, than they have been in the past couple years as teams have developed very good off-the-shelf modules that you can drop into your drivetrains. There's increased adoption, so there's more resources to help you get yourself off the ground. And I think even now, WPI Lib supports Swerve Drive out of the box. So if you, it's more plug and play than it ever has been, but it still is gonna have gremlins because it's just that much of a complex system. The size is pretty hefty and it's harder to integrate than a traditional tank drive. You have to make a special frame. It's not just like pulling the kit bot, kit bot out of uh, the kit of parts and building it. You have to be mindful of how you're gonna integrate it. It offers you some interesting possibilities in terms of reducing footprint and integrating into the rest of the robot, but you have to do those. Um, it's not just plug and play. The traction is of course the best and you get a lot of omnidirectionality, even if it can be a little bit laggy. There's a lot of practice required to deal with that slight amount of lag. And again, to leverage that amount of omnidirectionality you have. It takes a good driver to think about when they're gonna use certain modes, when they're gonna go about certain maneuvers. Um, it requires good practice and a good driver to make full use of a swerve drive. Otherwise, you may as well just be using a tank drive. So let's drive trains, but let's talk a little bit more because what were we talking about? We were talking about drive trains as a way to get from point A to point B. Generally, it's not about getting the robot from point A to point B. It's about getting a game piece, some object, uh, a load from point A to point B. So let's talk about ways to do that that aren't drivetrains because sometimes the solution isn't a drivetrain. Let's talk about omni drivetrains versus omnidirectional mechanisms. Um, my favorite example of this is Cheesy Poofs in 2018. Um, you can let's see if I can get the robot. They are the guy right here on the red side that's just dumping a cube into the goal up on top. You'll notice that he isn't turning around much. It's a traditional tank drive but it loads from one side and pushes the cube out onto the other side. They have optimized this machine towards particular tasks that happen the most frequently. So if you remember uh, Robonauts um, 2014, that robot with the um, sliding or the pop-up wheel, they had to rotate around in the middle of the field the cheesy poofs here, they don't need to rotate. They simply drive back and forth. They've optimized their mechanism to become friends with the drivetrain so that the cube simply moves from one side to the other without the need for spit fancy agility on the robot. You can also create a mechanism that has multiple scoring options. So that mechanism could actually score on both the front and the rear. 
It can only pick up from one side, but it can still score in two directions. That means the driver has more options as they're going um, from one place to another. They don't need to worry about defense quite as much. They can uh, have at least two positions that they'll need to rotate to rather than just one. And there's a lot of different examples of this. Uh, you could put a turret on a um, a turret on your robot. That means that the robot drivetrain doesn't need to rotate to the correct position. The turret can just spin to the correct direction and shoot. You can have bi-directional scoring as we just saw. You can even have bi-directional pickup. So maybe you pick up from both sides of uh, the robot as well. The other reason why you typically use an omnidirectional drivetrain is you need to get to a particular position. Again, you can make your mechanism strafe. So maybe you have your robot stay put and then have a redundant axis on your robot move side to side. So in 2000 and um, pull up that. Two thousand and nineteen, Roboteers had an interesting mechanism that did exactly that. They their final little scoring mechanism here actually moves left to right on a stage. That way they can go to the position or they can just drive the robot up and move the scoring mechanism over into the correct position. It gives them additional uh, maneuverability that actually is even better than having an omnidirectional drivetrain because defense can push them into a wrong spot but their mechanism can still go to the correct location. Um, those 10 pounds can move faster than 100. You don't need quite as heavy of an actuator to move a final scoring mechanism than you do an entire robot, so you can actually get to your destination faster. Um, another idea to get around is optimizing your gameplay around worst case scoring. So oftentimes, if you're getting defended, you're going to be pushed into a corner. Wouldn't it be great if you could score from the corner you just got pushed into? Um, so instead of needing to be wide open in the center of a field uh, in order to get a nice clean shot, optimize the rest of your robot around getting shoved into a corner where you won't get a clean shot. If you can spend more time optimizing that really dirty shot, but you can always get to that shot, you're going to actually end up scoring more consistently. And with that, let's let's talk a little bit about the specific technologies, uh, parts, components, and parameters you might see in a drivetrain. A quick crash course on motors. Um, brush DC motors are kind of simple animals, but uh, they require a little bit of nuance to think about. The general shape of how they work is essentially the same across all motors. So I'm going to talk about most motors and kind of the general trends that you'll see with them. But different motors can have different thermal capacities and efficiencies. Um, so Sim style motors, which are closed cases, um, they have no airflow. They will generally take a lot of punishment. Um, they can dump the heat right into the case, but the heat is really just going to stay in that case. Um, they will be happy to be ran really inefficiently and at low speeds, but uh, they're really heavy because well, they're just giant chunks of metal. 775 or 550, the style of motors that have fans and an open case that's usually made out of sheet metal, are more delicate. Uh, they don't have anywhere to dump that heat, 
In fact, they really like to be ran fast so that the fan in the back can reject the excess heat that they create. They are a lot lighter though, of course. Brushless motors are more efficient than their brushed counterparts, like the Sims, the 775s, and the 550s, but they require a complex motor controller and they can be more costly, although I've seen the prices start to get uh, really competitive with a brushed motor. They also generally have an integrated encoder, uh, which means that's one less component that you need if you're trying to do closed loop feedback and getting a mechanism to go to a particular point. So they can actually be very nice slick packages and in many ways just a straight upgrade from a traditional brushed motor. If you're trying to compare two motors um, in terms of just what they can do, a good way to look at it is peak power. Um, as long as you can control the gear ratio, the peak power is a good way to compare what two motors could do if they're geared appropriately. If you look at this motor chart, just focus on the pink line real quick. And on the x-axis, we have torque, and on the y-axis, we have speed. At full speed, 100%, the torque is the lowest, while at no speed, the torque is the highest. So at dead stall, no movement, the motor will produce as much torque as it possibly can. And as it continues to speed up, it will decrease the amount of torque it produces. What this means is actually the amount of power, the amount of energy that this motor is producing will peak about at 50% of the maximum speed or 50% of the maximum torque. Um, a, higher, a higher speed motor may have a lower torque if it has the same peak power as another motor. What you need to do is you need to gear it down. A gear ratio effectively changes the slope and intercepts of that pink line. So if you had a gear ratio of two, it might increase the torque of the motor and by a factor of two while decreasing the speed by a factor of two. You also notice this blue line for current. Um, the current consumption increases with torque, which would then mean that the current consumption decreases uh, with speed. If you put all this math together, it turns out that the efficiency um, increases as the motor goes faster and faster up to about 85% of maximum speed. That's generally where you'll see um, the peak efficiency. So oftentimes you'll wanna run a motor between the maximum peak power and peak efficiency. So gearboxes are what help you create usable power. High gear ratios give you higher acceleration and pushing force, but with a lower top speed. The low gear ratio gives you lower acceleration and lower pushing force, but allows you to top out at much higher speed. Um, shifting gearboxes, which have started to fall out of style as the overall power consumption um, rules have gotten lifted in FRC, can provide the best of both worlds. Uh, so you might start off in a lower gear ratio and then once you're up to a certain amount of speed, shift into a higher gear ratio. Think about just like a car. Uh, you want lower torque in order to actually launch and get going, but once you're up to speed, you'd rather be in those high efficiency ra ranges um, and have more range to continue accelerating, continue increasing your top speed. Now, how do you actually decide a gear ratio? Um, well, the point of a drivetrain is to get from point A to point B. It's not as comp not as simple as just saying, oh, I need to go 10 miles an hour or 20 miles an hour because you have to consider how fast can I actually get up to that top speed? How fast can I get down from that top speed? Do I need to get around some field elements? Will someone come in and push me out of the way about 10 feet through it? So cycling optimization or sprint optimization or time to target optimization is a much better way to pick a gear ratio than looking at top speed. Um, 
there's a number of papers on Chief Delphi that actually really go into cycling optimization, picking a cycle, picking a sprint distance, as well as many calculators uh, that can be used to actually look at and simulate how fast uh, you might get from point A to point B with a given set of parameters. Sprinting is really what you want to look at, not top speed. Let's talk a little bit about the actual components in a drivetrain. Um, there are a lot of different ways to transmit power in a drivetrain. The most obvious is gears. Gears are used uh, to transmit torque from one shaft to another. Uh, they come in a couple different flavors and varieties. There are different diametral pitch gears. So you'll often see 32 dp or 20 dp gears. Um, effectively, that refers to how big the tooth is. You can't interchange a 32 dp gear with a 20 dp gear. Same, you can't interchange a Lego gear with uh, a Vex Pro gear. There are different tooth sizes. So you need to make sure that they match between the teeth. Gears are heavy, they're compact, they're strong, and they're efficient. Um, so because they're just compact, strong, and efficient, they make great gearboxes especially because you can change the ratios and increase the torque. But because they're heavy, you probably wouldn't want to transmit uh, torque from one side of your drivetrain to another with it. It requires precision between the centers as well. Uh, so that center to center distance may need to be plus or minus five thousandths of an inch, uh, which you can hold on a gearbox, but over the whole spread of uh, a 20 inch long robot frame, maybe not so much. Um, there's a lot of different suppliers you can get them from. You can get them from VexPro, Antimark. You might have them in steel versus aluminum. Uh, steel is going to be much more wear resistant uh, than an aluminum gear is. Although the Teflon infused coatings on VexPro gears can provide some degree of wear resistance. Another popular option is timing belt. Timing belt is effectively a toothed rubber belt with a fiberglass um, core running through it to take up the strength. They come in a couple different varieties. HTD belts are the most common in the FRC world. They come in nine millimeter widths and 15 millimeter widths. GT2 and GT3 belts have a similar profile and are somewhat compatible um, and they're a lot stronger. Timing belts are light, they're quiet, fairly strong, they're not infinite, they're not super strong, and they're also quite efficient. So they're great for transmitting loads from one point to another. Um, I really like belts. The only problem, of course, is um, they need pulleys, and the pulleyed center to center distances, you can't get them perfectly small, so gears are still a more compact option. Um, and you can only get certain size belts and certain size pulleys, so your options are a little bit more limited as to what you can actually make happen. The precision between centers isn't quite as strong as with gears. Uh, you can have a little bit more slack, especially depending on if you're talking about a heavy duty drivetrain versus a lighter duty high speed flywheel. Um, you may have different precision requirements um, but again, you're kind of limited to certain options that you can buy on the belts. Chain is a very, very strong power uh, transmission option. There are a couple different varieties. The major ones you'll see are number 25 and number 35 chain. Number 25 chain has a quarter inch spacing between links Number 35 has a 3 8 inch spacing between links. So the 35 chain is significantly bigger, significantly heavier, and significantly stronger. Chain is heavy, it can be loud, it can be very strong, and you have flexibility in how you space it because you can buy and break the chain links to uh, increments of a quarter inch in the case of 25 and 3 eighths of an inch in the case of number 35. 
The chain will stretch, unlike Timing Belt, though. Um, the stretch is a little bit of a misnomer, though. Really what's happening is the bushings are wearing out, so the chain gets longer as time goes on. That means you may need to add additional uh, rollers to provide tension on the chain as time goes on. That may need adjustment. It's something you're going to have to keep an eye on, although it is a very strong and uh, flexible option to use. Shafts are, of course, an integral part in any drivetrain. Um, they come in many different ways to interface between a shaft and a hub. Um, there are splines. Uh, these are costly, fancy, usually custom, although the Falcon 500 motors use a small spline shaft. They are very strong though, because you're providing a lot of interfaces for load to get transmitted from one point on the shaft to many points on a hub. But of course, they're a strange shape, so they're pretty expensive, hard to make. Keyways are lower strength. They're basically, you'll see those in the top right there. There's a shaft, there's a key, which is kind of a rectangular or square cross-section piece that interfaces between the shaft and the hub, which also has a groove to accept that key. They're low strength, but they're very cheap, quite common, um, and they can be a little gross because they're not very strong. Sometimes people will make these with aluminum components, and the aluminum just does not have the local strength required to make keyways work. Keyways should always, always, always use a set screw um, that pushes down on that key to keep it seated if possible. Um, or a clamping collar or something in order to keep that key from rocking and fretting in the materials. A hex shaft is really the best of most of the worlds here. It's a simple spline effectively as you just have a hexagon cross section um, that interfaces with a hexagon hole in a shaft, or in a hub, sorry. This shape is a lot easier to make than a spline. Uh, it's easy to extrude, so the shaft is readily available. You can put um, sockets on it, you can put wrenches on it to actually turn things. So you can actually do certain things that you can't do with the spline shaft with the hex. And so for that, they're almost the standard in FRC usually 3 eighths inch flat to flat or half inch diameter flat to flat hex shaft. Squares, square shaft um, is quite common in VEX robotics, not VEX Pro line, but VEX robotics themselves because again, just like a hexagon, it's cheap to make, very easy to make a square, provides really solid torque transmission. D shafts are not so common in FRC, but they're quite common in industry um, because they're very cheap, easier than a keyway, um, and in some ways can even be a little bit easier to make work than that keyway. Always make sure you're using a shaft with the accompanying hub, and piloting can be important. Um, piloting is basically making sure that the actual hub is concentric with the wheel. So this round boss on this Versa hub and these uh, small dogs on the Versa hub help line up everything to make sure that it's running square and true. This especially matters if you're using something like a flywheel that's spinning at many, many RPM rather than just a drivetrain. Friction is a sticky subject and a lot of people get kind of confused about friction. There are a couple different types of things we might call friction or traction effectively what it comes down to is traction refers to um, the force that something can provide against 
another surface considering that it could dig in as well as just have um, friction. Friction is uh, the force between two sliding surfaces or two surfaces that could slide. Um, so you think a tire that digs into dirt has a lot of traction. Um, a way on a lathe or a precision machine would have friction against um, a sliding component on top of it. Of course, these both matter. Um, in FRC, we're generally working with tires on carpet. Carpet can be dug into a little bit, um, in some cases, a significant amount. So it, friction models get kind of sticky. Um, the traditional physics model, uh, also known as Coulomb friction, uh, has both static and kinetic friction. In these models, uh, surface area does not matter at all. If you have 100 pounds sitting on the carpet on a five square foot area, that has the same force you would require to push it as 500 or 100 pounds on like a one square inch space, right? Um, it doesn't matter how much surface area you have, it just matters what the contact force is. In, um, and as soon as things start sliding, the force generally starts to decrease. So if you can keep things from sliding, you'll increase your traction, generally speaking. Of course, the real world is much more messy than this, and oftentimes you'll need to actually do some empirical testing um, in race and uh, vehicle and car applications. Tires are very complicated, and there's companies, of course, that are dedicated to testing and figuring out the correct compounds to use to interact properly with uh, the road. And so figuring out the parameters and trying to find out what tire works just right can require a lot of testing. And usually it's only going to be testing. You're not going to sit around in a room and debate about this or that or the other. You're going to have to put rubber to the ground if you want to figure out what tire works best, what tire pushes the hardest. With that said, let's, we'll still talk about the different types of wheels and generally why they might work better or worse than others in some applications. A very popular option in FRC is removable tread wheels. Um, the two main types of removable tread are rough type nitrile, which can be in different colors, and wedge top. Uh, basically just different patterns in how that tread actually comes into contact with the carpet. Um, the idea of a removable tread wheel is you can replace the tread as it wears out every match if you really wanted to, or just every event, however frequently you're seeing that you need to replace your tread. Versa wheels, which VexPro makes, are a cheap option. Everything is molded, uh, so you aren't replacing the tread. You'd be replacing the entire wheel. Any Marks High Grip are the same idea, just a different manufacturer, different compounds, and a slightly different tread pattern. Um, both of these are really high grip options, and uh, you'll see them used quite frequently, especially because they're dirt cheap. So replacing them is easy to do. It uh, can be even easier than the removable tread. Of course, the tread is probably going to be cheaper in the long run. Colson Performa tires or wheels are a, a mixed uh, a mixed bag in terms of popularity. Some people really like them, some people don't. Uh, they don't have a tread. Um, the tread is a much thicker and smooth material. Um, that means that it's going to wear very consistently. Um, there's no tread to actually dig into the carpet. It's basically relying on friction rather than digging in and producing traction. Um, a lot of people like these because they'll produce more consistent results. They don't want their driver feeling different round to round. They would rather just take a slight performance loss 
and behave the same throughout an event with no need to replace wheels. They also produce consistent results, so autonomous routines can work a lot better with a Colson wheel than these higher grip options. But again, empirical testing can really be important here. Pneumatic tires are a simple solution if you need to add suspension or shock resistance, although they can also be quite grippy in some applications. Some considerations with any wheel, how are you gonna mount it? How much grip does it have initially? How is that grip gonna change as time goes on? Is it gonna be consistent or is it just, is it going to change at all? Um, as well as how does this wheel behave forwards backwards versus side to side? So a tread is going to behave differently if you push it forward to backwards versus side to side. Um, it's something you need to be aware of especially if you're using a tank drive. Um, if it has a lot of side grip, that means it's gonna have a lot of turning scrub. Talk back about these Omni wheels. There's a lot of different options there under the sun. Um, both Andy Mark and Vexpar are very popular manufacturers of Mechanum and Omni wheels. Uh, some things you need to be considerate of, of are how are you gonna mount it? What's the grip of the wheel going to be, I mean, what you make those rollers out of, again, is going to dictate whatever friction you have. What's the efficiency going to be? Some of these wheels use bushings on the rollers. Some of them use bearings. Some of them will roll really smoothly side to side. Some of them will kind of stick and sputter. So if you're using them in an Omni drive, you may need them to be very efficient. But if you're just using them to replace some corner wheels on a tank drive to reduce turning scrub. A low efficiency wheel may not be the end of the world. It might be just what you're looking for. Durability is also important as these are very complex parts with lots of tiny components. Uh, they may not survive bumps as well. Uh, there was a lot of teams in 2020 that blew through some Omni wheels that were cheaply manufactured uh, and cheaply built or just, you know, they're not built for surviving impact with a bump. Ride quality is also an interesting concern. So this lower left wheel, uh, you'll notice has just one single set of rollers, whereas the other two Omni wheels on the right have multiple sets of rollers. So you can imagine that the leftmost wheel will kind of have bumps and stutters as it moves around the ground than the right two will. That can be important both from an efficiency standpoint, from a noise standpoint. If you have a person on it for whatever reason, that can be quite uncomfortable. And if you're trying to score something or make a shot, you need your robot to be at a consistent location. So those bumps and detents might not be a good idea. Again, turning scrub is quite important. Um, so picking a center drop, that's reasonable. Um, the higher the center drop, you might have better maneuverability, but only up to a certain point. At a certain point, you're just going to be rocking your drivetrain around a lot. A lot of teams actually like to use a eight wheel drive on their tank drives. What this does is it provides a consistent flat spot while still pro providing a wide wheelbase for maneuverability and preventing the robot from falling over. You may add outboard omnis in place of a center drop. That way you still have reduced turning scrub, but um, you don't have any sort of rock in your drivetrain. So when you go to make um, a shot, or if you're trying to line up with something accurately, you'll always have your robot be at a consistent orientation. Let's talk about a couple different construction um, methods, um, how you would actually build a drivetrain. A West Coast drive is a common way of actually laying out components in a typical tank drive. Um, in this case, you have wheels that are accessed from the outside. This picture actually doesn't have the wheels on, but you can see the stub axles where you would put a wheel. You can easily access those, change them, swap them, have a lot of serviceability. These 
drives can be more complex in some ways, but they can be more compact as you have just a single drive rail. Um, there's a lot fewer structural components. There's some variance on how you'd build this. In some cases, you might have a live axle, which is an axle that rotates. Um, in some cases, you might have a dead axle, which is an axle that does not rotate. And instead, you would need to have a sprocket directly on the wheel in order to transmit the torques. Another common construction method, especially used in the kit bot, is a, a double dead or doubly supported uh, shaft in which case you'd have dead shafts that are placed in between two side rails of the robot. Um, it's very simple, very cheap to make one of these. It's what the kit of parts robot is for that reason. Um, it's very easy to mount bumpers to it, but it's a lot harder to swap wheels as it's not just as simple as taking one bolt off and pulling the wheel out you may need to actually get in your robot, unscrew um, a dead axle, drop the whole wheel out, uh, worry about the chain, put the new wheel on, slide the chain back on, put the whole thing back in. So the wheel swapping can be a lot harder. Um, that being said, it's very strong mounting. It's a very structurally robust system. You can also build this with a live axle instead of a dead axle if you move where the bearings are. There's not a lot of benefits to doing it that way because the wheel swapping is still hard, but you can do it. Some general design principles of a drivetrain. Um, every drivetrain, every point in a drivetrain is a failure point. Every connection in a drivetrain adds some compliance or backlash. Uh, some connections more so than others. Um, so a chain drive can add a lot of backlash. A gear drive may add a little bit of less. A belt drive can usually be very low backlash. Um, and better load paths usually beat more material. So a pulley that is twice the diameter will provide you the same strength as using a belt that is two, two times the width. Uh, so oftentimes just creating and using larger diameter pulleys gets you a lot more than just using a wider pulley if you're noticing that something is breaking, snapping, or you're just worried about um, potential breakage, using a larger diameter pulley or gear can usually net you lower forces and thus stronger parts. A little aside, a lot of people don't think about the programming on a drivetrain but how you program it can also provide serious benefits um, or really shoot yourself in the foot. There's different mappings um, such as Chessy Drive and Exponential Scaling, which changes how your joystick, joysticks are mapped to the user. So it can create a feedback that feels more natural um, if, or at least more controllable once you're up to speed. Um, look into a lot of scaling and mapping if you're really interested in that there's a lot of great papers on how to use it as well as i think some of it is built in to wpi lib these days with omni drives you can add features such as field oriented drive and gyroscopic stabilization um, field oriented drive effectively makes it so that the driver pushes forwards on the joystick and the robot always moves forward down the field you use a gyroscope on the robot to figure out the current heading and with additional programming, make it so the robot follows the directions on the field. This makes it so the driver thinks less about, oh, I need to turn left, which direction is my robot facing? And more about, I need to go over there, I'm gonna move over there. Gyroscopic stabilization, um, as well as heading snapping, can let your uh, driver think less about controlling the current rotation of the robot, and again, focus more on just moving from point A to point B and letting the machine take care of the rest. I think that's all I'm gonna do in this um, presentation. Um, 
these case studies didn't work out too well last time. Um, so if there's any other questions um, while I'm here, I'll check the chat. Anything else, anything I didn't cover that you think would be beneficial for any other listeners to hear? Okay, well... Thanks for tuning in, folks. Um, we'll get this guy edited up and uh, have a lovely rest of your day.